that make sense, you guys? So while we are here, let me just cover one concept before I go back. Because I covered this, this is one of those very important principles. It will always be worth repeating every single time. And it cons uh, concerns our main topic today. So how many of you guys heard about you should shorten your stride? That's the current teaching. Yes. You heard of that? Both of us. Because that's, you know, with the Kenyan runners coming, you know, to, you know, to the, uh, getting all the attention and the chi running teaching and also post method and also to injury prevention. The past 10, 20 years, the slogan is always shorten your stride. Back to old days, we'll always say lengthen your stride. But do you understand shortening your stride? Does that mean make this as short as possible? Or does that mean you change position of one of the foot? When you, so the appropriate way of shortening the stride, and the reason what resulted in the movement about shortening the stride is because most people, when they try to increase their speed or the power, we do this. It's the front. We try to reach too much. And so when we reach that much, see what happens? The lock need. And what? Exactly. The knock need a heel strike. That's the root of a lot of evils. That's why the movement, you know, and also watching Kenyan runners, you know, all about mechanical development will tell you to shorten a stride. But remember, bark this to your mind. Shorten a stride only applies to the front. We want the front legs to be shortened. By doing what? Not coming, not not by kind of bringing the whole leg back, bending the knee more. So the knees the over the first ball of the foot and the chest is over the knees. What does that look like? Lunge. Starting position of track runners. Am I right? That's how you set up. You both you have enough body with leaning, so you're almost kind of falling out of balance to give you that initial jolt. And also you have enough elast you know, the spring in this, because the first you know, nanoseconds are the most important part. That's the reason why so people, you know, people have so much foul you know, there, right? So shorten the stride applies to the front leg. We don't want the overreach to have this lock knee heel striking pattern. We want to be here. But the overall stride length, we don't want to be too short. Do you really want to run around like this? Yeah, that's very short strike. That's really tiny chicken feet you know, strike. Doesn't work. No matter how much you can, you can gain in terms of the cadence. Cadence means how many times you, you, know, you switch between the feet within a minute. It's not enough to cover the massive loss of the power you get. So shortness stride applies to the front leg. The hind leg, we don't want it to be too short. So shortness stride, actually, the truth is, it's a shift of stride. It's not about shortening stride. It's going from here to here. Does that make sense? It's, see, the stride length doesn't change much. The body also has a, you know, has a way to gauge how much stride length you want. It's either through here or through here. When you shorten the stride in the front, guess what? You naturally to do this more. Doing this also give you a term, you know, so you guys will probably hear this. It's not a very commonly used term. Most people don't use it. This is called a stride angle. Usually, stride angle positively correlates with speed, power, performance. Good runners usually have a good stride angle, the stride angle here. You won't hear that term very much. That's come a little bit more of a, on the narrow, narrowly used, more among the, the pros, you know, professional, you know, more of a, not professionals, you know, the people who are specializing in helping the, the pros, the stride angle. So if you have a really short stride, how, how, how big is your stride angle? You're not going to achieve much. So short and stride really should be a shifting of the stride. Instead of here, you're here. Here has a few things. A second, another concept I want you to get is hip extension. I covered this before. I will cover again detailedly in another meetup. One of our best indicators about running power is called a hip extension. How much this, this is a, look, this is hip extension. This is back extension. Back extension doesn't count. I want back straight, hip. That both gets you the maximum glute power and also because it causes a stretch on the hip flexors and your quads that gives you the elastic recoil, pulls you powerfully forward here. Our running relies, efficient running always maximizes elastic recoils. Otherwise, it's too much muscular force. Elastic recoil is nature's power there. You use it. You, you want, you want, you know, when you want to jump really high, if you, you're allowed to cheat. Do you want to land here or do you want to land on a spring so you can really jump really high? That's the elastic recoil, spring, springiness. So when you have the hind leg 
you almost almost want to think about it. The, lo the better the hip extension, so to actually the longer the stripe behind you, the better. Does that make sense? So I hope I covered them. Pardon me? Can you show us how it's done? This? Yeah, if I do really you know, short, so if I do more of a front running, this is like no hip extension. This is no hip extension. And you see how I, but if I want to have more hip extension, I'm, my hip flexors are tight. You, see, you guys see the difference at least. I'm really not at the best shape to run right now. But you see, I'm all, I'll illustrate you. This is no hip extension. This is hip extension. But a lot of time we don't need the stride length to be that long because sometimes you don't need that kind of speed. But even when you have a low speed, I want the ratio to be more behind you instead of front you. So even if I'm just jogging, see how I really try to strive this. Even and then I go even slower. I would still try to be like this instead of just you see the difference. Here versus if you can really strive for that. That push off. Does that make sense? So that's the main topic for today. But how do you feel that and engage that? Let's do a little drills upstairs. Is that helpful guys? So alright, so who's fired up to work on their hip extension? Exactly. First hip extension, what we need to do? We need to have enough length of our hip flexors. What's our modern day lifestyle? Yeah, do we really lengthen this on a regular basis? No. So unfortunately, we have to do something, sorry, to counteract that. Hip flexor stretch, it's almost a daily thing. And unfortunately, I also find that, you know, our bed <laughs> is infinitely soft. No matter how hard your bed is, infinitely soft than what the ancestors are used to, right? For some reason, after a night's sleep on modern day beds, even if you said it's a firmest setting, almost everyone's hip flexors get short. So I recommend people stretch this on a regular basis throughout the day. The key, the trick for this one, you can you stand like this, but for some reason when you stand stretched like that, we tend to arch more the back. When you have a cushion, if you can put the knee down, it's easier, so you literally have to activate your core to arch the back, to push it back. And then use the front leg, just pull you forward, like we talk about the foot running, right? So you can feel the stretch really here, as far as you can, hold one minute on each side. Yeah, because you don't have the length, the body is going to cheat. It's going to overarch the back or just simply not do it, not do the hip extension. Really stretch that, okay? Anyone feel the need to stretch? Stretch. If you don't, don't worry about it. You know what? This may be a little bit more padding here, guys. Come here. On the, on the thick turf here, it's a little bit more padding. I don't want you guys to hurt your kneecaps. For this stretch, it doesn't really matter too much because okay. so all we care is this. But it's easier, that's true. This, you know, you kind of lose the balance. Carry the only drawback is if your knees over the toe, you're gonna lose balance. Okay. So you do want to reach forward a little bit more. So however much, yeah. You get a little bit more padding here. So if the kneecap is, you know, too much for your kneecap over there. Come back here. Yeah, I have it on the video there too. So increase, so the increase the hip extension, first thing is you gotta have the material, length. So I can't stress enough how much we all need this stretch every day. And then from here on, just watch, this one's a little harder on the kneecaps. It's with quads, how many muscles are there in the quads group? Four. Exactly, that's the name implies. Only one of them, called rectus femoris, crosses both the knee and the hip. That muscle functions the secondary hip flexor. So we gotta get that stretched too. So we stretch the hip flexor psoas, iliac psoas, then we back off a little bit. If you can, reach for the ankle. If not, use a towel, belt, whatever you can, or your, the pen leg to pull it up. And same thing, but oh, both stretches I forgot to mention, you thrust, squeeze and thrust the hip to push open the front of the hip. This one especially also, you thrust, squeeze and thrust the corresponding hip to push forward. That gives you more stretch in the front of the quads, right? You guys feel that? So these two stretches, it's almost like it's my bread and butter stretches. Is there another way to stretch that second muscle without um, putting too much pressure on the knee? Uh, yes, actually. First, you know, uh, the easiest is sometimes people find that, you know, you can, you can use cushion or you can do it standing. The standing stretch, Cheryl, we can do this. But a few misconceptions I got to, you know, correct is, first, I don't want you to have the heel to the butt. 
because if you shorten this this much, you can't really extend this portion. It's this portion of that muscle I want to be stretched. So you actually, I want to just touch in the, just kind of almost put the heel away from the body here, and then thrust the corresponding hip, squeeze and thrust forward. Squeeze and thrust. You feel more, right? Oh, yeah. Nice, really, yes. So that's a milder stretch, okay. but it's more you know, more doable, wherever you are, oh, my right? Squeeze, thrust. Yeah. When, see, hip flexors, you want to st uh, stretch that muscle, use the, the something called like a, um, reciprocal inhibition. You want that muscle not to be activated. So you activate that muscle's antagonist muscle. That means the muscle do the opposite function. So you squeeze your glutes. And that makes sure the hip flexors are not activated. They're completely turned off. And that also gives you the push to go to mileage, to stretch it. So that's the first step. You need the, hip, the, the range of motion to do the hip flexion. And second, we talked about this about you know, uh, applies especially to tomorrow. Remember, I want you to be a little bit lower. Uh, the landing in the front, we talk about to shorten the stride, right? Because the first, this half, yes, we do want to shorten the stride. We want to land like this. So practice a lot with your lunge position. You can deep lunge, short lunge, to the point that even when I'm just standing, sometimes, see, that's, that's a mini lunge. You guys see that? That's a mini lunge. If I bend the front slightly, if I kind of keep, you know, hip, and you kind of lock behind, that's a mini lunge. It's the mechanics. Anytime you do this, you send a signal. I want to be there. That's how I'm supposed to be. And when you do that, anytime, remember, that one leg is behind, assuming that hip extension, what you do, that side of the glutes should be squeeze, thrust. You do the mini lunge, squeeze, thrust, squeeze, thrust. And when you squeeze and thrust the hips, you, do you guys notice the core is activated too. Does that make sense? You kind of need both. You need both. Yes, that's the position. We're not supposed to be fully relaxed when we stand. You want to be fully relaxed, you have to lie down. We want to support, we want to be mechanically correct, both any for standing, walking, or running. Our core and glutes have to be activated. That's the center. That's like the axis. You can't have anything object that's standing up that's totally kind of loosey-goosey, right? You have to have this. That's the reason why it's called the core. The core needs to be activated that way. So even when you're standing sometimes, mini lunge. Here, that's a mini lunge. You feel the glutes are squeezed, active, you know, the ab is activated, you know, supporting scaffolding. Yes, that gives you neurological, you know, um, feedback to do that. And the second is, the next is, how do we work the back part of the hip extension? The key for this part is actually have more to do with how you do the hind leg, is what the appropriate do is I want the knee to be straight and the glutes is activated, so your body weight is here, so try this. I almost, you know, we repeat this exercise almost every meetup because it's that important. So what you want to do is you want to see if when you do this, do you feel that moment when you squeeze the glutes and the legs is extended, when you shift the weight on it, when you let it go, do you feel almost there is an elastic pushing to make you easy landing on the opposite leg? That's what you're looking for. See, the moment when you lean back, when you kind of, it's almost like you're, this is almost a little bit like you're sitting on a, on a stool that's made of your tushi. You shift your body weight on your glutes, tushi, from there, and then let it go. Let the body relax, and then you just kind of a natural land on the front leg with bent knee. So that's another way of really practicing the running stride there. So to do this, yeah, that was good. Okay, so Scott there, I see the thing. Okay, let's, let's review this one as well. Let's go back to the, to the jump rope. Everyone, I noticed most of, you guys are, all, most of you guys are fine with jump rope. Let's do the jump rope thing again. And watch what you're doing right with jump roping. Yeah. Especially Scott, pay attention. Do you feel you go from midfoot, you press, you have that active process of pressing to the heel. You don't just midfoot high, midfoot heel, midfoot heel, right? That elastic, that pressing, that's what we all need when we land. We want to land on the midfoot and then press to the heel. The only difference between running and jump rope is, I mean jump rope we're right here, but the running is you land on the midfoot, when you press, the body is passing. Does that make sense? So it's a here, here. So go from jump rope here, here, 
That's the only difference. But I want you to keep that pressing. That's why I call it, it's like during the process, when you're from midfoot landing, you want to almost press the heel to the ground. And here comes another thing that associates with the shortened stride. We want to shorten the front, the stride of the front leg. So we don't want to land on the, we don't want to, we do not want to strike with the heel, right? But guess what, the hind foot, go for the heel. I dare you, nobody can touch the ground with the heel because the calf is limited. But your process of going after the heel, the hind leg, if you strive at the end while the knee straight to push for the heel, you both stretch the calf muscles and you activate the elastic recoil to give you this springiness to push yourself forward. Does that make sense? Did you see the difference how you have to treat the front and hind leg? They're totally different classes. We want a short stride, no heel strike. The hind leg, we want to be as long as possible. We, let's there for the heel. Does that make sense? So that's the goal is every step, that's why the running should be. Every muscle takes turn to contract and get lengthened maximally. That's the idea of ideal for any kind of a sport because our body goes through that full cycle coming back. If you do that right in the ideal world, we shouldn't get injured. Actually also stretching is not as necessary because during the process, every muscle takes turn to activate and get stretched. Your calf gets stretched here. What else gets stretched every step? If you have long stride, your hip flexor gets stretched. How's that? And then when you come off, because you come off, still come off, then the quads get stretched. And then when you're, yes. Isn't that wild? So, so, one, one, no, so now you guys get that kind of a press to the heel. So now try this. So now jump rope, you know, we're just right here. So split the leg forward, see if you can, especially focus on the hind leg. See if you can maintain that, that little springy, you know, springy pull press to the heel. Hind leg, hind leg. I mean, you want both legs to be worked by this one, especially I want you to scan you, lock the knee behind you, and then press from the midfoot to the heel. That was good. Scott, see if you have, that was good. If you add that to the running, then that will be, and plus your hip, you know, flexor stretch it out. Yeah. You feel the difference, right? Yeah. And you guys feel that when you do that, especially the hind leg, your glutes are activated, right? When you press that, especially if you press and you force the knees straight, the glutes are active. You kind of almost have to activate the glutes. So, is that helpful, guys? Because that's what I'm saying, there are a lot of complicated exercise, a lot of things you do, but I'm here to integrate what you already have. Does that make sense? It's not about strengthening this much. It's all about can you activate, and that was good, at the right context. Yeah, so the only thing for you carry is the hind leg, I would strive for locking the knee. Cause I want lock. Yeah, that, to feel the, the stretch for the whole, you know. Lock the knee, the knee lock behind, always with the glutes activated. That looks better. That looks better. Okay, so, um, I'm trying to kind of uh, finish the things at 10.30 because we're running a little bit behind. Because we do have a few things concerning this, I will just preview a little bit what we'll cover next time, you know, or future things. This is just an idea for you guys. When, this goes along with the good activation because we have two bunion case. This is the first ball of the foot. I have to say it's one of the most important joint on the foot. I usually, I, I'm a chiropractor, I do a lot of things, but I never adjust that joint because I'm paranoid about messing up that joint. That joint is just so important. That's messed up, just a chain reaction, how many things will, will, will start compensate. So when we push off, this, unless you go back and check your own pattern, usually you won't notice. When we talk about midfoot landing, we are talking about, see this is the joint, it's a hinge. We want this portion. That's what your midfoot landing is about. If you're landing any here, anywhere here in the front, I mean the orange color, anywhere here up to the front, those are all toe landing. There is a world difference. When it's toe landing, there's not enough activation of the glutes. See, I can do this all day long here. My glutes can be completely on vacation. But if I land here, so a few things. If you land on this back portion of this high, and second, it pushes the body kind of backwards a little bit. It's like if you don't activate the glutes, you can't maintain it, you're gonna fall right away. You have to shovel the glutes underneath to be able to maintain it, to be able to land appropriately on the midfoot. 
there. Does that make sense, guys? Try it. It's a very narrow window. If you see, you can, everyone can be here, forward. But if I don't want your body to lean forward and the heel low, can anyone be here? It's hard, right? It's hard to do this. You fall back. But if I switch my glutes, then I can maintain my heels off, just barely off the ground. This, I find neurologically also, it's a switch for the glutes. Hmm. See, this is toe running. We don't want those are in the session. Use this color. The pink is what we wanted. Let the pink go. This is what we want behind the joint. So that's a bit foot landing associated with a heel off, but it's very low off. See the difference is here you can see me. That's on the midfoot. I'm kind of trying to illustrate on a walking. So that's on the midfoot. This is on the toe. This is on the toe. This is a midfoot. Midfoot is for the switch open of the glutes. In order to have a midfoot and to be upright without leaning forward too much, the glutes have to be shoveled under. I know, when it comes running, you kind of have to change that. Okay. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, the ballet, how it maintains it, it's a little different now because they have more of a this dimensional opening. So they can, this, then this goes to the different topic. How we want our body is, our body is something we call, the, there's a model called the tensegrity model. It's so the whole body is, you know, should be through some kind of a tension. Kind of, it's like we're a inflated balloon. There should be tension throughout everywhere. That's what provide a good elastic recoil to do a lot of the things with minimal effort. Then that kind of goes a little bit beyond you know, this topic. So we're doing everything to maintain that. All the elastic recoil, springiness, all concerns that. But late answers to how they can maintain it, they have more of a horizontal. So they maintain a recoil from this. That doesn't quite apply to running. Does that make sense? So they can maintain good function and still have that kind of enough recoil. I mean, do, you can't do ballet without enough recoil and spring in this, right? You know, you'd be jumping like this and like this, you know, it'd be ridiculous, right? They maintain it in a different uh, directions. But running, you can't do that. Unless you're gonna run in sideways, yes, then of course, then you can totally. This, you can have good elastic recoil this way. Does that make sense? You kind of have to apply things differently. And that also, so to, yeah, to we want to spring load here, and then it's important, as I talk to you guys, or I know a lot of patients, I have some you know, more knowledgeable patients tells me, the natural position for the toes, they are seven degree, turn out like this. I'm like, yes, I agree. And then when you do uh, squats, you always told toes turn out, that's more natural, right? But do you want to generate that elastic recoil to have that little tension like the surface of the balloon? Then you do this. Have your feet parallel. So let's do a little experiment. Let's try it. If you do with extreme pigeon toe, and if you just let it kind of a hand relax, you relax your here, right? If you're pigeon toed, in order to stand up straight, what do you have to do? Did you guys see that? Yeah. Did you just feel there's more increased recoil? So I'm not asking you to be pigeon to be deformed as a pigeon toe, but if I put you in something that's kind of somewhat more pigeon relative to our natural body position. It activates that, makes you like somewhat inflate the balloon with that massive, you know, superficial, not superficial layer of, uh, of uh, what is that, surface tension. And that's the base of the full body elastic recoil. Hence, for that reason, I want your toes to be forward. This way, because even toes for forward, you want to be totally relaxed right here. Do we want to stand like this? We don't. That kind of is the incentive for shoveling this underneath. Does that make sense? So and that also applies to people squatting, but that's a different topic. You know, we can be here like 24 hours and still talking. So <laughs> I gotta stay focused on the topic because you're talking about mechanics. That's my passion. I won't ever stop. So, so is that helpful, guys? Yeah. Help is helpful. We have a bigger group. I want everyone to get an analyze. We probably didn't have enough time to do a lot of different drills, but you guys got the key concepts. Once you have that, you can kind of devise things yourself too. I have some patients make this more of a dancing thing at home, cha cha, turn on the music. But you make sure the hind leg, you know, it's really straight. 
like that, and then you can turn, you know, change angles, you know, things like that. But just really the key is you want to feel that body. Those are some of the most important principles. During that process, you're also practicing this, too. I have a quick question. Uh -huh. So in changing from heel strike, where you're actually, you know, starting with your VMO, your, your the heel strike, one. you don't start with it. Yeah. Right. So how do I get that to fire if I'm landing on my mid foot? Many on the mid foot, when you How push... I get that? Because you talked about that spiral. I no, guess. when you put... The spiral is from here right. to here to here. When you push off, you come... You know, that's kind of extension of this top we'll cover next time is... You want to come off from this called the first ray. Okay. The first toe and the ever bone extension from that. If you force yourself to come off from there, uh -huh. do you see my activation of this muscle? That. Exactly. Okay. That's why this is such an important switch, both for this part of the quads and also for the glutes. Yeah, guess what? You know, uh, kind of athletes have a good, you know, have actually the best intuitive understanding of this skiers. They, a lot of them, the good skiers, they know how they adjust the big toe position that changed the whole body shifting linear. That's I found out by accident. I talked to everyone, but only the skiers is like, I know because that's what I do. So does that make sense? And then just add a little bit more. You know, we also have a joint here, right? I'm gonna have to do something very unartistic choice. So this is the. The first, the, the, the joint of the big toe, the interphalangeal joint, right? When you don't hinge on this, you go in here, you're putting a lot of stress on that joint. And that, it's to protect that joint, there's muscle called flexor hallucis longus. The toe, the muscle that flexes this joint that goes from here, here, all the way up to the deep calf. To the deep calf. And when that muscle constantly gets overused, that's one deep reason for a lot of, uh, kind of in deeper calf problem and deep shin splint problems. So, anyway, so that's that, you guys, you know. Thank you so much for coming. If you guys had a good